Hello everyone, Rob Guest from Football.London here and welcome to the latest episode of Gold and Guest Talk Tottenham, sponsored by NordVPN. Joining me as ever, it's Alice the Gold. Ali, you well? I am, I am. I, I, I hope you are. You sound very bright and breezy for a man whose club has had a points deduction this week, which I should point out to people, in the last podcast we did, we weren't aware that that happened as we were recording and I had assumed afterwards that Gessie had just been incredibly ultra professional uh, while that news broke that his club was uh, going to get knocked further down the Premier League. And uh, he hadn't actually found out. So <laughs> not to say that you're not normally ultra professional, but uh, yeah, I just I wasn't quite as impressed as I originally was. But uh, yeah, no, good to have a little second kind of bonus pod this week because we've got a fair few bits and pieces to talk about. It won't be a long one. It's just a little kind of one to to tide everyone over until the big early kickoff on Saturday at St. James's Park. Um, yeah, a few little bits and pieces for us to uh, chat and discuss. Yes, so we've got Saturday's game against Newcastle United. That's on the agenda. Uh, we're also going to be taking a look at Tottenham's lone players. But before that, some news from the Premier League has uh, just come out just before we start recording. So, Ali, do you want to fill everyone in on that news? Yes, uh, an unexpected little addition to our pod discussion, which uh, we weren't <laughs> expecting, just suddenly emerged as we were about to hit the red button to record. So the Premier League uh, have announced at a Premier League shareholders meeting today, clubs unanimously agreed to the introduction of semi-automated offside technology. The new system will be used for the first time in the Premier League next season and is anticipated the technology will be ready to be introduced after one of the autumn international breaks. The technology will provide quicker and consistent placement of the virtual offside line based on optical player tracking and will produce high quality broadcast graphics to ensure an enhanced in-stadium and broadcast experience for supporters. It's got to be a good thing, isn't it? I think just, just get it closer and quicker to what we need it to be. Yeah, I think so. Obviously, I think VAR has helped with the offsides, but the issue is just the amount of time it takes. There's yeah. probably been some examples where it's been four or five minutes and you want those quick decisions and hopefully this will help. Yeah, it was the World Cup, wasn't it, where they had, um, I think it was there, that they had some aspect. I don't know whether it's exactly the same type that they'll use in the Premier League, but it did feel like a much quicker process. Yeah, uh, I think... It is what they had in the World Cup. It's something needs to change. And obviously, Premier League are looking to do that. And yeah, fingers crossed it will be a good thing and doesn't follow down the same route as VAR. And we have a number of controversial decisions every week right. to speak about. I know. I wonder what Ange is going to say. We'll have to ask him tomorrow at the press conference. He's not a fan of technology, although I think he's a bit like me in that. You know, the goal line technology is absolutely fine. That's great. Even like with the ridiculous one we had with Brennan Johnson the other day, it, was, it wasn't it was over the line. That's fine. If it's not over the line, even if it's by a millimetre, it's not legally a goal. So that's fine. And I wonder and I hope that this kind of provides some aspect of that, pretty much a definitive, uh, you know, decisions on things. And mainly, like you say, quickly. So we just get on with the game and we don't have to... I hate where they can't celebrate. I hate that, what they've done to the game in that aspect. So, yeah, hopefully that fixes that. Right, we'll move on to the players who are currently playing away from Tottenham Hotspur Stadium on loan. We'll start with Jed Spence, who has been in the headlines today. He's uh, on loan at Genoa in Italy. Their sporting director, Marco Ottolini, he's been uh, speaking to Court Offside about Jed and what the future holds and couple of key lines in there. I think one of them is uh, basically Genoa are in contact with Tottenham and they're going to evaluate a deal over the next few months. Uh, that just gives them and Spurs time basically to understand uh, their positions and to want to get Jed's perspective as well on their permanent move. It's, uh, it's been an okay loan spell so far uh, for the player. I think nine appearances in Serie A, five of those from the start, four of those come in uh, from the bench. Seven games left in the season. I think all Jed can do now, you know, is try and make his case and whether that's Genoa or other interested clubs at home and abroad, just to spark a bit of interest in his services because, you know, two years on from his move to Spurs, it's not gone to plan. It, it really is a big, big summer for the player. Yeah, it is. I mean, 
It's a funny loan move. I keep looking at it in different ways. You could look at it and see that he's not a regular starter. He's not starting every game for Genoa. But then you could also counter that by saying, but he's already got more minutes than he did at Leeds and far more than he got at Spurs, which, let's be honest, it was about 40 minutes, I think, in total at Spurs. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, It's been okay. He's had some games he's started and he's come off at half time. He's had one game, so I can remember when he came on at half time. So they looked to him to change things. And he's had some quite good performances. Um, I think he was particularly good against Juventus, if I remember correctly. Um, it, was, it kept helped them keep a clean sheet. Um, and he's done that, though. Like, a, um, what was it, Ren, wasn't it, when he played against PSG and they raved about him? It's almost like he's a bit of a big game player. Um, yeah, it's the only thing that slightly worried me about those quotes was. There was a mention of Jed can do more, isn't there? I think there was in there, yeah. and it's like I don't, I didn't want to hear that again. It just kind of feels like that's the theme. That's what we keep hearing at each kind of club he's gone to. And to be fair, I don't know if we heard that entirely at Wren. I think that's probably one where there was an injury towards the end of the season, and he just was essentially filling a a gap for their right backs to come back from injury from. But um, yeah, we'll see. I. I I don't know whether I'll end up staying at Genoa or not. I, I kind of I read those quotes and they almost seemed to me like, yeah, we haven't decided yet. There, there were, you know, there was aspects to it that I thought were quite promising that they they do like him and he has settled in well, which is great. But yeah, I don't know whether we'll end up seeing him as a Genoa player kind of going forward or not. I mean, some people have asked like, oh, can Ange make him, you know, a superstar? Can he be a right back for Spurs next season? I would pretty much say. I'd go as far as a ninety-five percent chance of that not happening. And just did not fancy him. Didn't last summer. Didn't really like the look of him from what he saw. That was why he didn't really play, and he was heading off. And even when he came back from the Leeds loan, he was sent to train with the under twenty ones. He wasn't part of the first team thing. So while I get it, and I get the fact that you know he is, he's certainly got a hell of a lot of ability and talent. I just don't think he's a Postacoglu player. And I think Postacoglu seems to feel that as well. So, yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, he's still got a fair chunk of his contract left. That was, would have been quite a long contract. I'm trying to think now. He signed two summers ago, wasn't it? Um, I would imagine it was five or six-year deal. So another um, three or four years left yeah, to go, really. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, the option in the Genoa deal was seemed to be very low. Um, which kind of suggests they're just willing to take anything from him, which is not a great kind of look either. Yeah, it just hasn't worked. I do feel for him because there is, well, how do I say I Maybe mean, I don't feel for him because I do think there's aspects of Jed that hasn't helped himself. And certainly the manager comments at various clubs have suggested that. However, I do feel for almost the wasted talent. Uh, but again, I don't want to go too heavy on that because it does feel like on the whole, the general loan has been quite a good one. Um, I wouldn't say it's been an absolute resounding success, but definitely it feels like he's got back on track in certain aspects. And uh, yeah, we'll see what the summer brings. If anything, hopefully it sets him up for a move this summer. You'd imagine probably another loan move, maybe. Um, maybe get someone that kind of takes him over the season and really builds his value up. But uh, yeah, it's all about him getting back to where he needs to be and where his talent dictates he should be, um, because he can be a very, very good player. I suppose the thing with Genoa is they're probably not going to be flush with a lot of money in the summer like other yeah. clubs because basically they're a mid-table Serie A club and they've done really well this season to say they got promoted back to Serie A uh, at the beginning of this season, got a chance of finishing in the top half as well. So, you know, they may in the end decide the money's better spent elsewhere, but They'll come to that decision over the coming weeks and months. Uh, but I think for Jed, he just needs a permanent move away from Spurs, ideally, just to get his career back on track and hopefully getting back to those levels that he showed at Nottingham Forest, what in the end, you know, resulted in Spurs making a move uh, for the player. So we'll move on from Jed. Just very quickly, uh, on, just then. very quickly. The only thing I was thinking about is cash wise, they have the Dragashin money. Um, Goodmanson looks like he's probably going to go in the summer as well. Um, Spurs quite interested in him as well. So whether they kind of have quite a bit of cash and suddenly think, but like you say, you know, as a potential backup right back, it is 
I mean, what was the the report was a 10 million euro, which is what about 7.58 million, something like Probably that. 8.5, yeah, something. Yeah. So it, it's a fair whack, maybe for an Italian club to play on a backup right back. But uh, yeah, but we'll see. We'll see. Right. Who shall we speak about next? Because there's quite a few uh, on the loan list there. Uh, Alejo Villiz. Yeah, we could talk about Alejo Villiz. I mean, the interesting thing about the loan list, he's not one of those, is that there's so many players with a year left on their contract <laughs> in it and, and decisions to be made. But that's not the case with young Alejo. Um, it just another low move this one especially that just i did think at the time it was a sudden big jump that was my only fear about it was it was a, a young striker who was playing a handful of minutes here and there occasionally from the bench for spurs was suddenly going as the number 10 to severe a team also kind of been struggling you know they they need kind of a real sudden influx of uh, ability in that team and i did think it was a bit of a big shout for him to go in there and and suddenly be the player they needed. And it kind of, unfortunately, looks like that's been the case. He's He hasn't got a lot of game time in the last month or so. Um, has Certainly hasn't got any game time in the last two weeks because um, they haven't had a match. I'm presuming they were going to play one of the Copa del Rey finalists, um, at Athletic Club or Mallorca. Or Mallorca. Um, but yeah, just hasn't worked for him either. Needs to be... Needs to be a but I'm, I'm guessing maybe it was quite a good deal for Spurs financially. That's a guess. I don't know how much would be involved in a in a deal for a young 20 year old striker, but on the face of it, I, you could have maybe thought of some other moves that could have worked for him. I know language wise, I guess it's a good move. Uh, settling in maybe is a bit easier there, but yeah, just hasn't worked for him yet. I don't know how much it'll benefit him. Bear in mind, this is a, a young guy who was playing regular football in Argentina. It's not like he kind of needed to be suddenly shown what first team football's like. Um, so yeah, I kind of feel like that could have been a better, better chosen destination for him. It screams a bit of Jed Spence Tottenham club signing move because I think it's very much that it's Kike Sanchez Flores, the former Watford manager, who's in charge there. Feliz has been in and out of the squad at times. And I think the same goes for Hannibal, who joined Severe on loan yes. from Manchester United at the turn of the year as well. And very much just seems as sporting directors signed them, managers not right keen on them, not gone mm. to play them. But yeah, fingers crossed it'll change for Belize in the coming weeks because he definitely needs to get some more minutes under his belt, especially after coming back from that injury as well. What he uh, sustained, I think it was... Bournemouth game, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. New Year's Eve. Uh, but yeah, it's just one of these things for Spurs and the loan players. But I'm, I'm sure it's the same with a lot of clubs. You never guarantee your players going out and learn to be playing every single minute. And But there's been a number of examples for Spurs in recent years where the loan moves just haven't really gone to plan. And I think we'd probably say the same about maybe Alfie Devine's loan move to Plymouth. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Um, I think for Ashley Phillips, it's been a terrific loan move. Yeah. I think he's really done well there uh, and getting lots of game time. For Alfie, it's been a bit stop-star, even though they he did have Ian Foster there before he um, lost his job recently. But obviously, he um, obviously like people <laughs> everywhere would know this, but he was his England, was it under-19s or under-18s uh, coach? back in the day. So he knows Alfie quite well, but even under him, he wasn't starting every game, he was kind of coming in and out. Then he managed to pick up um, in that final game for Ian Foster, his first ever red card as a senior pro. So that meant he missed last week's game uh, or the weekend's game. And then he was back on the bench in midweek. I think they were playing QPR. It was a bit of a basement yeah. back then, wasn't it? Yeah. And um, which it was a draw, but they, uh, yeah, he didn't come off the bench in that one. So, yeah, I'd, I'd agree. It's a difficult one. It's one of those where you take him away from where he was playing week in, week out to to bump him up a level to the championship. On the face of it, I understand it completely. And I think we said at the time it made a lot of sense. But then it hasn't worked. It hasn't worked as of yet. He's um, he's getting the experience of a higher level. But then I guess, you know, for a player that we were hoping maybe this summer would be you know, part of the pre-season plans again and, and really maybe push his case. I wonder if it's going to actually knock his confidence a bit and maybe they'll think he needs to go back into the championship for another go. But uh, 
especially with Lucas Bergvall coming along as well, who I know we're going to speak about. So, yeah, not great, but for Ashley Phillips, a good move at least. Yeah, in terms of the others in the championship, Joe Roden excelling for Leeds United. I think that should be quite an easy deal. You'd think it's a complete, especially if Leeds win promotion to the Premier League. Uh, they're in a free horse race with Leicester and Ipswich. All three teams didn't win uh, this yeah. uh, in midweek, so it makes it a really, really exciting end to the season. Uh, Leicester did lose away at Millwall. Japa Tanganga is getting quite a lot of game time there. I think it's 14 starts from yeah. 15 appearances. Uh, That's after... massive for him. That's massive, especially with the knee issues he's had in the past. Yeah. I actually looked at it thinking he probably wouldn't have played the midweek game as well. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, he did 90 in that as well. So it's brilliant for him. I'm so happy for him because he's just had a nightmare with injuries. He's just had such a stop-start career and he's doing so well there. So yeah, he and Joe, I think you could probably look at reasonable moves for them this summer because of these loan spells. We talk about the other ones not working, but those two, these two moves for them have been absolutely spot on. They have uh, another move in the EFL that's where it's Matthew Craig at Doncaster. He's getting 100%. regular minutes under his belt. Doncaster, I think about four points off the playoffs to put together a bit of a late run. Seven in a might, row, though. Yeah, it might be a tad too late to get in there, but certainly put themselves in the mix. And I think the confidence is, is there at the moment. So... I think they'll have one eye on the playoff and what an end to the season that would be uh, for Matthew Craig if he can help them into the playoffs. Yeah, it, that's that's a move that's kind of gone a little bit under the radar maybe because obviously we've been including him in our loan roundups, but maybe people weren't too aware who he was and obviously he's gone to a slightly lower level. Uh, if anyone's forgotten, he actually came, he's made his Premier League debut for Spurs. You know, he came off the bench, didn't he, under Ryan Mason, that final game of the season with George Abbott um, last year. And he's uh, he's done incredibly well. He is a mainstay of their midfield. Scotland under-21 international. Um, like I say, yeah, Grant McCann side, they won seven in a row. They're absolutely flying at the moment. Like I don't know whether it is going to come too late, but... He's played, I think it's 14 times for him. He scored a goal, he's got an assist. And that's for a defensive midfielder as well. Uh, and they love him there. And uh, yeah, I'm very interested to see what happens for him next season, whether he then steps up to something like the championship he could do. But a uh, massive one. And there's two, been two really good other under-the-radar loans that people might not be aware of, and they're goalkeepers. Good Josh Keeley's uh, in the National League at Barnet, and he's doing very well there. They're going to have playoff football at the end of the season to see if they go up so that's going to be a massive experience for him and the pressure that brings and everything uh if you're not aware josh keely's um only 20 years old republic of ireland under 21 international a lot of high hopes for him at spurs um you know with potential goalkeeping departures this season uh, this summer maybe one or two he might maybe step up into a, a bigger role we'll see but Goalkeeping loans are so difficult to find. So even, you know, finding one in the National League is massive for him. Uh, and young Sam Archer, he's at Barton Rovers, which is right down the leagues. It's in the uh, Southern League Central Division 1. Um, and he's got four clean sheets in a row. He's only 17 years old. And it's what they call a work experience loan because he's that young. Uh, but he's gone down there. He's playing, you know, I used to cover that level of football a long time ago. Funnily enough, they drew nil-nil against one of the teams I used to cover many years ago, Waltham Abbey. Um, and I know what a physical, tough league that is. You know, that that kind of level there is, there's people just trying to make a little bit of money on the side to kind of, for their lives. There's people that have dropped down from Football League or even Premier League Academy. So it's such a mishmash of talent and, and ages. And uh, for yeah, for a 17-year-old to go in there as a goalkeeper and keep four clean sheets in a row, it's really fantastic. So uh, yeah, very kind of uh, just excited for him. It just must be a great move. I'm trying to think of who else we haven't covered. Troy? Yeah, Troy uh, Parrott. Tri Parrott's doing well in the Eredivisie with Excelsior Rotterdam. I think it's seven goals, four assists so far uh, this He's season. He's been out for a little while. He's been out for the last month or so he's had a, an adductor injury i think it is uh no abdominal injury which uh has been a pain but other than that yeah it was doing very well yeah uh sergio reggion at brentford agent reggie 
Yeah, two assists at the weekend against Aston Villa, which has helped Spurs out in that battle for Champions League football. Uh, bit of a mixed season for the player in and out of the Manchester United team when he was there on loan, getting more football under his belt at Brentford. And fingers crossed that will, you know, either become a permanent move or help him get a permanent move away from Tottenham in the summer. And then the final one on the loan list, uh, your hero, your favourite player, Tongi on the belly. <laughs> <My hero>. uh, <laughs> how's he doing? Uh, well, not so well. <laughs> not so well. Yeah, it hasn't worked out for Tongi. Um, yeah, he's he's very playing very very little football. Um, they had a weird kind of match at the weekend. I say match even is a loose term for it because it was a Turkish Super Cup final on Sunday, or it was meant to be. Um, Galatasaray up against Fenerbahce. Um, big showpiece event. However, it had already been rescheduled. I think it was supposed to be played in December. I think it might have been been played out in Saudi Arabia originally as well. It, it was somewhere else. Didn't happen then. Got moved to this Sunday, uh, last Sunday. Fenerbahce were very unhappy with that. They wanted it to be postponed because they had a Europa League quarter final against Olympiacos um, tonight, actually, I think it is. Um, so they wanted um, more preparation time. It's funny that a lot of European leagues do that. They kind yeah. of help out their teams. The Premier League just batters them. <laughs> like, no, 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 we're more important. Um, and so they wanted it rescheduled. The league said no. So what they did is a bit of a protest or quite a big protest. They sent out a youth team who played the first minute of the match. Galatasaray scored through uh, Mauro Cardi in the first 50 seconds. Fenerbahce then took their youth team off the pitch a minute in. So the game was kind of then became null and void and it was a one nil win essentially to Galatasaray. And then I think they realised, oh no, we've got like a stadium with fans in it who have paid for a ticket. What are we going to do? So Galatasaray ended up playing a game between first team players or some first team players and reserve team players of which I have no idea what the score was, but certainly some photos we've seen. Tongi appears to have been involved. He wasn't in the starting lineup for the cup final. He was on the bench. But he seems to have been involved. And what did make me chuckle, because it's classic Tongi, he was playing in his beanie hat that he wears all the time. And I have seen that man train in that beanie hat in the most ridiculous temperatures on pre-season tours. So he can, he can absolutely do it. I just found it hilarious. So, yeah. Played in a final that never really was. Um, he's barely cobbled together about 400, 500 minutes across his appearances this season. It's barely been anything. Um, he's not starting hardly any games at all. Maybe one every few months. Um, yeah, just absolute horror show of a move that hasn't worked for him at all. And he's surrounded by Spurs players. There's loads of ex-Spurs players there. Um, Carlos Vinicius, Serge Aurier, uh, Davinson Sanchez. It's still not getting anywhere with him. So I don't know what Spurs are going to do with Tongi in the summer. <laughs> I literally feel like they kind of put him out on like a kind of a car boot sale just to try and get him out of the club. I just don't know how anyone's going to take him after. If you can't go to the Turkish League with no disrespect to him, but judging on the other levels he's played at, to go to the Turkish League and barely start a match, who's going to take him off their hands this summer? I think they're really going to struggle, and I think it's last year of his contract. It is, yeah, as well. And he's had, you know, disastrous loans at Leon and Napoli. They've not really worked for him either, so he's going to be so so hard, you know, to get rid of him. I just wonder if they go, we'll just pay him up, and go right, we'll, we'll call it a day. But then the players got to, you know, uh, agree to that as well. I'm sure. I mean, if you're if you're as a player getting exactly what you would have got anyway, I suppose it's a no brainer. It's like almost like a, a redundancy payoff type thing, isn't it? But if they have to come to some kind of compromise, I'm guessing he'd probably think, "Well, why? I've just sat in Turkey yeah. essentially for a year, not doing much. So what difference does it make?" Um, oh, it's just been such a disaster. It has, as someone who just brought with him such high hopes, he's absolutely dashed them at every turn. <laughs> And I'd love to be able to stick up for him and say, oh, but, you know, he's got his talent and all that, but I'm sorry. But if you're going to keep going to, you know, even the, uh, Napoli last season didn't really play a big role in their title drive. He was there in the odd match, started a few. But won the Scudetto, kind of, though, didn't he? 
Well, that's yeah, but it's one of those, isn't it? You've kind of that'll be on his CV, and I'm sure he'll be very proud to have it on his CV. But will he have truly played a huge part in getting it? I don't no. think so. Um, I just, I just have this feeling he's going to look back at the end of his career and think. Oh, I was great. I was, and and everyone else was like. So, what did you do? And you're like, I was on the bench for all of these teams, and it's just such a waste of such a supreme talent. It is a uh, couple of other players to discuss quickly. This is in regard to Tottenham's future. Luka Buskovic, he is in Poland with Radomajak Radom at the moment. <laughs> I'm glad so, you had to say that, not me. Yeah, he's he's doing really really well uh, for the Polish team. Playing regularly, he scored two goals already. I think one of them was a bit of a bullet header. It actually went close to a hat trick of headers in that match. Then he scored a few weeks ago, a really good finish in the area after the ball had fallen to him. And he did get an assist to his name uh, wow. the other week. Uh, not a classic defence splitting ball, it was just simple pass back to the goalkeeper who's then booted it from 18 <laughs> yards and it's gone over the opposition goalkeeper. Uh, All counts. Very much does. Uh, did see a highlight of him uh, last Friday playing. I'm not going to pronounce the Polish team's <laughs> name. It's an absolute murder it. But uh, they were winning 2-0 uh, on the stroke of half time. The opposition had a free kick on the edge of the area and do you remember the free kick Netherlands played in the World Cup against Argentina? Rather than yeah. shooting, played it to someone next to the wall. Yeah, they did that. Vuskovic, who was in the wall, was alert to the danger and you know managed to slide in. Somehow get a block on the ball, went for a corner. He celebrated. Four of his teammates came over to celebrate with him as well. So really, really uh, good play from the player, and I think he'll be playing at a higher level next season, which will really help Tottenham out. Uh, How old is one, he now? 16 or 17? 17, yeah. I think. I think he just turned wow. 17, turns 18 I think next February, and it's 18 when he can link up with Spurs. So yeah. still a bit of time to go, but he's yeah. definitely making a name for himself in Poland. The other one, Lucas Bergvall. Really, really good start to 2024 for the player. In total for Joe Garden and Sweden on the 21s, four goals and five assists. Uh, for Joe Garden playing is an attacking midfielder. Uh, he's actually going to be playing in the Swedish Cup final on May the 1st against Malmö. Luckily for him, because it's July the 1st when he links up with Spurs, the Swedish Cup comes before that time. Uh on the way to the final in the semis uh, against AIK, he's got a really good header. and He's got a brilliant header as well on the opening day of the Al Svenskan season. So I think in terms of Bergvall, probably a lot of people only know him for the qualities with his feet, but he's displayed mm. how good he is in the air as well. And then last week, or oh, sorry, on Monday, they're playing Hacken at home in the league, 3-0 down. Uh, after 87 minutes, managed to come back and draw 3-3. Free, free. Uh, so he played the role in the second goal, winning the ball on the edge of the area, forcing the keeper into a save. And then they managed to complete the turnaround. So Bergvall's going well. So he's going to be able to hack it in the Premier League? Then? Yeah, that's terrible. But yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll go with it. Some, <laughs> it's good for him. I, it kind of feels like he's stepped up uh, his level. Yeah. with the kind of move to Spurs, almost like he knows all eyes are on him now. And that's a great sign. I think the pressure's maybe on him in the spotlight even more. And he's taken it in his stride by the sounds of it. Very much. I think really, really impressive loan spell. And I think he probably made it clear after his move to Spurs, he was going to do all he can to help Jurgard and, you know, mm. be in a really good position before he goes. And for them to be in the Swedish Cup final, they've won it five times uh, in the past. I think the last victory in the cup was about 2018 so you, you never know might be able to lead them to glory in that and put them in a good position in the Al Svenskin as well uh, something else what I noted when I was on Joe Garden's website is uh, they're actually sponsored by NordVPN yeah look at that segue I love it yeah, so I was having a look and it says we are happy to state that NordVPN is extending its strategic partnership with Jurgarden Football for a third year in a row. 
And I think we'll be closing in on three years as well with NordVPN. Yeah, I think it is. God, look at you. Look at you. Yeah. Very on brand in your search <laughs> for how Spurs players are doing. I love it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Perfectly timed as well to to have a quick chat about NordVPN. And, and like you say, it's been a few years now we've been partnered up with them. And they've obviously always, always been very good to us. And, and great that we can kind of spread the word of them to other people and, and all of the communications we get. Honestly, I still do. I'd probably say I, I get at least a few messages either on social media or sometimes we get the odd email or comments under the YouTube videos just to say that it's worked for them and, and how helpful it's been. And yeah, no, I do enjoy that. It's it's one of the stranger things that I could never have predicted that we'd have get people contact about. Kind of, we always think, yeah, they're going to tell us whether they like or dislike what we're doing, but to actually get people telling us about how the people that sponsor our podcast have done, uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's nice. It's very different. And, uh, you know, and I can understand why, because it is the fastest VPN in the world. There's no buffering, there's no lagging, and you can stream your favorite shows in anywhere in the world without your bandwidth throttling. Something I've done many, many times over the years, whether it's watching various Marvel, Star Wars related shows I'll watch, or dramas or whatever, or movies, um, to be able to kind of watch them abroad from the services that I've already paid for over the, here in the UK is very, very helpful. Um, and also from a security aspect, if I'm using public Wi-Fi, it can just help a little bit to lock down some of the things in your device to stop those nasty people getting in and getting them out of there. Um, and, you know, the Outlander NordVPN subscription is cheaper for you in the long run. That's because you can purchase streaming services or bookings from other countries at a much cheaper rate. So guest is, you know, always telling me that when he's booking his many, many holidays, uh, he will look at the options of booking them from countries abroad using NordVPN so that he can, you know, potentially get a better deal out of it as well, rather than booking them from the UK. Um, and honestly, it means you're kind of paying out for Nord, but you're saving money overall. There's a whole host of other benefits from signing up to NordVPN, so why not give it a go? To get the best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. There's no risk with 30 Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, and you'll help support our podcast every time you uh, take up that plan. The link is in the episode description box in case you just missed it there. Right, we'll move on to Saturday's game against Newcastle United at St. James's Park, 12.30 kickoff in the North East. Looking forward to it? Oh, I don't, <laughs> not really, no. I hope that it was one of those where I've got no expectations and it ends up being a great one because, yeah, there's the early start, there's the memories of last season which still make me shudder every time i think about it you and i sitting there in the press box getting absolutely soaked by the rain because there's no cover our laptops getting soaked fear of like just getting electrocuted as well uh and watching potentially probably the worst game of spurs football i've ever seen spurs go out there and do honestly we thought it, it was like a goal a minute at one point. It just felt like they were going to end up losing like 20 nil or something. Uh, it was shambolic. It was the end of the Christian Stellini era. It was trying to play a back four that had no idea how to play a back four. It was in front of a noisy crowd who were going to be like that again. Because, you know, Newcastle put a little bit of a form together again. I think now they've got less competitions to worry about and some of their injuries subsiding. They've, you know, been able to start getting back to what they were. So it's not going to be an easy game. Um, just have to hope that maybe Spurs just starting to find their own rhythm again a little bit in some respects. Um, they've got players that are, 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 you know, finding the net. They've got defensive players that are doing quite well as well. So it's going to be a great game. Obviously, they quite comfortably beat Newcastle at the Spurs Stadium, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. However, that was a bit of a shattered Newcastle. They were at, I think they'd played a million games in a, a few days at that point and had some in, a lot of injuries like Spurs did. But still, they knew how to play them. So it'd be interesting to see kind of how much both teams have learned from that game and uh, yeah, what comes of this one. Because I think I'd be interested to see whether he sticks with the same starting eleven. My, I, my gut would tell me probably not. No, I think he changes it. I think he definitely changes his midfield. I think back four stays the same. Yeah, Eve Basuma has been virtually an undroppable for Spurs this season. I think it's 23 starts. The one appearance off the bench came 
uh, straight after he turned from AFCON. He started well against Forrest, getting some shots off, but then he just seemed to all go to pot a bit yeah. in Spurs' midfield in uh, you know, the second half of the opening 45 minutes. So I, Pierre Emil Hoiberg and Rodrigo Benteke, for me, have played their way into the team. I thought both were really good. Yeah, there were a couple of instances late on where Hoiberg gave the ball away, including one pretty dangerous pass across the uh, face of his own box, but on, on the whole, I thought they did really well, just help Spurs, you know, gain control in midfield and just show that experience and leadership in there. Uh, I think that's going to be needed at St. James's Park. It'll be a really, really tough game. Uh, Newcastle have done well on home soil this season in the Premier League. I know it's been a bit of an up and down year for them, especially compared to last year when they were just absolutely fantastic and gunning for Champions League football. They've... Uh, this season, it's 10 games. They've won, drawn three, including one against Everton recently, and then they've lost three uh, at home. So, going to be a tough one. But Spurs have done all right on the road. I think it's six wins from 15. Uh, so, they'll be looking to make it seven. But, yeah, for me, I think there'll be a couple of changes in midfield. And then probably your only other question mark is, does Dane Kulisewski, uh come in uh, on the right Uh maybe for Brendan Johnson. But Johnson, for me, has done really, really well in recent mm. weeks. And I think he deserves to keep his place in the team. The only other one you can maybe think of is if Richarlison's back fit after missing out last week and in a position to start. But I think it's more than likely that, that if he is back in the squad, that he will be a place on the bench to begin with. Yeah, I think probably just the two midfield changes. That's all I, yeah. I would imagine, unless he really feels he needs uh, Kudusevsky for, I don't know, the running element of it. And, and, you know, you keep looking at all these stats about the most chances created for Spurs, and Kudusevsky is still way at the top. He's right up there at the top. So I understand that, you know, people have currently got him down as the one who should nowhere, shouldn't be in the team, all this sort of stuff. But he does actually create more chances than anyone else for Spurs. And I'm sure Postacoglu is well aware of that. But personally, I think probably Benteke Hoybier come in. Um, unless he feels like in training, Basuma has like, trained like a madman to show that he, he needs to start again. You never know. Um, but I, I'd agree, I think, in terms of the experience. I think the thing with Basuma that he does bring you, other than the... 20 minutes at the end of the half the other day is he does have a bit of a calm head when he's in you know with his back to his uh, sorry with his facing his own goal when he receives the ball on his on the edge of the Spurs box I think that's what Postacoglu loves about him the ability to turn in those situations whereas exactly like you said we saw Hoybier do one of those and it went horribly wrong uh, he can do it but there are occasions when he can very much switch it off he's, he's not ideal under pressure in those moments so you're going to probably get quite a bit of that at St. James's Park with Newcastle pressing and the crowd behind them, willing them on. So I wonder whether if one of them isn't going to come in, maybe it is Hoybier. Maybe Basuma does keep his place and he plays Benzinka as well. But yeah, if I'm if I'm Hoybier, I would be very disappointed in that because I think he did enough to suggest he should start um, at both ends of the pitch as well. He does He's more of a an attacking threat than uh, Basuma is, and he, he contributes more in that area of the pitch. So, yeah, tough game, very tough opposition, tough place to go. Um, but these are the kind of games that if Spurs do, as Postacoglu says, want to mount some kind of title challenge next season, that's that's what he's expecting of them and the players are expecting. You've got to go to places like St. James's Park and not be overawed by it and certainly not have it anything resembling that catastrophic mess of last season. I just wonder with assume if the time is right just to give him a breather. It might be beneficial as it was for Brendan Johnson a few weeks back when it was basically just have a go on the bench, just watch the game and then go on and make an impact. And you know that might be the catalyst for Basuma getting back to his best levels because We've not seen him at his best since probably October, since that red card against Luton. It was absolutely mm -hmm. sensational in the opening weeks of the season. And he's he's not been at the top of his game since October. And those suspensions, I think it was three in total. The AFCON uh, tournament, it's meant it's been a really, really stop-start period for him at Tottenham. 
uh, of the past few months. And Tottenham need to get him back to his best. And he needs to be at his best, especially if Spurs are going to be looking at bringing in a new number six uh, in the summer. So he needs a big, big end to the season. The only thing it, I would say very quickly is you're saying he's had a stop-start season and then you're saying that you should stop and start him again, <laughs> like bring him out. He hasn't yeah, really but, played that much football. That's the problem. But I think it might be the last seven games he started and it's one of these where he's, he's not been his best. So either oh, I agree. You, you, keep, I you keep playing him, try to play him into form, mm. or do you just go for one game, right, we'll drop you down to the bench and it, that might work. Yeah, we don't know. Do. Yeah, it could do. Like you say, Johnson's a good example. Someone that sat on the bench, looked exactly how they were going to impact games, where they could kind of do what they need to do. I'd hoped it was going to happen with Kulusevski. It didn't, though. He kind of came on and was a bit wasteful um, the other day. But, uh, yeah, no, I, t I take your point. I just wonder whether, in terms of kind of bringing him out, whether it actually does interrupt his flow. But then I guess he's already done that by taking him off at half time. So, yeah, maybe. Well, we'll find out in the weeks ahead whether that is, is the case. Yeah. Uh, but I think all eyes will certainly be on the team sheet at St. James's Park. Uh, I was actually looking at Tottenham's record at St. James's of the past 10 years. What do you think it's like off the top of your head? Because I'm sure everyone will probably just remember 6-1 defeat mm. last season, 5-1 defeat uh, in the 2015-16 season. Yeah, well, even without what I'm guessing you're setting up, um, I, would, <laughs> I think I probably would have said reasonably decent anyway. I don't yeah. remember too many defeats. You know, going back to even like... Timotei Atuba's amazing left-footed rocket kind of thing and, and things like that. And yeah, I don't remember too many of them. And, and Tongi scoring a lovely goal there as well. Um, and yeah, no, there were quite a few where they've done all right there. That was one of Nuno's last few games, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, that was yeah. Tottenham's last victory at St. James's. Uh, yeah, since the 2013-14 season, at St. James's, Tottenham, uh, won six, drawn one, lost twice. Really yeah, impressive yeah. record. Like It's just, as I was saying, it's just the big, big defeat. It's what everyone remembers. I want you. I want them to send you into the dressing room before the game and tell them those stats. Just make sure. Although Ange doesn't like the past, does he? Everything's different. <laughs> Never look back. Um, I hope they don't look back because, yeah, the last one was rubbish. Um, but, yeah, it, you know, is it a different Newcastle now? Maybe that's another thing to put into there. Although obviously they were a bit of a force way back. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's going to be very much its own game this time, and and hopefully Spurs are yeah a similar performance to the one at home would be lovely. Yeah, hopefully a change in fortune in regards to the twelve thirty kickoffs as well, because this is the fifth one for Spurs this season, all being away as well. Started well at Bournemouth and Luton, but then it was that, you know, disastrous late defeat at Wolves in November and then another uh, late goal in the draw at Goodison uh, at the beginning of February. So that's really unusual for a team to have five 12 30 kickoffs and all be away from Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. And it's not even a team in European competition. Right? There's like no mm. reason for to have all these early ones either. Normally they do that if the team's got like a Tuesday match the next week, don't they? Just to get them as early away from it as possible. Um, yeah. yeah just, it's just stupid. We've got to just leave so early on Saturday morning to get there as well. And I'm sure everyone traveling up there is doing it. And, and even for the fans, they're up in the gods as well. They have to kind of sit all the way up there whereas... We just get so, although it's supposed to be quite a nice day, I think, at the moment on Saturday. Whether that extends all the way up north there, I don't know. But down south, it's supposed to be very nice. So maybe we'll get a sunny day for a change. Well, I think it was supposed to be a nice day 12 months ago. And it absolutely <laughs> lashed it down in the end, didn't it? So, Brilliant. <laughs> uh, I wonder if the weather. No, that's uh, fair. Yeah. A couple of other things to note in terms of Tottenham fixtures. Uh, there was an announcement from the Premier League yesterday regarding, I think, the final or the penultimate round of fixtures. Spurs play Burnley. That stays Saturday, May the 11th, 3 p.m. kickoff. Now have a date in the diary for Tottenham's Premier League game against Man City. That was due to take place next weekend, but it's not as City are in FA Cup semi-final action. That's Tuesday, May the 14th, 8 p.m. kickoff. 
and then Spurs will finish the season 4 p.m. at Burn at Sheffield United, sorry, on Sunday, May the 19th. So yeah, I think that's about it for the second episode of Golden Guest Hot Tottenham this week. We'll be back early next week to discuss hopefully a win at St James's Park. Oh, just very uh, quickly before we go, well, only because I just remembered that the uh, Tottenham Hotspur win, of course, this weekend. The oh, women yes. have got their semi-final uh, against Leicester City at the Spurs Stadium. Um, I think that's an early kickoff as well. That's twelve p.m. I think as well. So massive um, game for them as well. And I, I think, you know, there's still no doubt probably plenty of tickets to go and see that as well. So that'd be a huge occasion. It'd be great if both men and women's team could have a very big weekend. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, huge weekend for the football club mm. coming up. Right, we'll leave that there for today's latest episode of Golden Guest Talk Tottenham. Zeva, thank you for tuning in and just keep with us at football.london for all your latest Tottenham news. To get the best discount off your NordVPN plan, go to nordvpn.com forward slash gold guest. There's no risk with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee and you'll help support our podcast. The link is in the episode description box.